Merhabalar, merhabalar. The Polyjuice Potion, Chapter 12. They stepped off the stone staircase at the top and Professor McGonagall rapped on the door. It opened silently and they entered. Professor McGonagall told Harry to wait and left him there alone. <clears throat> Harry looked around. One thing was certain. Of all the teachers' offices Harry had visited so far this year, Dumbledore's was by far the most interesting. If he hadn't been scared out of his wits that he was about to be thrown out of school, he would have been very pleased to have a chance to look around it. Daha ikinci yılında dört beş kere uşak okuldan atılacağım diye düşünce şeyler yaptı. Ben hep çok fazla yaşıyor bu şeyi. It was a large and beautiful circular room full of funny little noises. <coughs> a number of curious silver instruments stood on spindle-legged tables wearing and emitting little puffs of smoke. The walls were covered with portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses all of whom were snoozing gently in their frames. There was also an enormous claw-footed desk and sitting on a shelf behind it a shabby tattered wizard's head, the sorting head. Harry hesitated. He cast a very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, very, Surely it couldn't hurt if he took the head down and tried it on again, just to see, just to make sure it had put him in the right house. He walked quietly around the desk, lifted the head from its shelf and lowered it slowly onto his head. It was much too large and slipped down over his eyes. <clears throat> just as it had done the last time, it put it on. He stared at the black inside of the head, waiting. Then a small voice said in his ear, Be in your bonnet, Harry Potter. Be in your bonnet, oh how long. Atasözüm size bir şey söyledi ama tam anlamadım. Uh, yes, Harry muttered. Uh, sorry to bother you. I wanted to ask you been wondering whether I put you in the right house, said the head smartly. Bak, ilginç bir nokta daha. House'u büyük harfle yazıyor sesini ama head'in head'sini büyük harfle yazmıyoruz mesela. Why? Ne? O hat'in koyduğu house'lar büyük harfle yazılıyor ama hat'in kendisi yazılmıyor falan. Mom, dad onlar büyük harfle yazıyor. Bu hat yazılmıyor yine. Buna benim bir teorim vardı ama şimdi aklıma gelmedi. Yes, you were particularly difficult to place. But I stand by what I said before. Harry's heart leapt. You would have done well in Slytherin. Harry's stomach plummeted. He grabbed the point of the hat and pulled it off. It hung limply in his hand. Grabby and faded. Harry pushed it back onto its shelf, feeling sick. You're wrong, he said aloud to the still and silent head. It didn't move. Harry backed away, watching it. Then a strange gagging noise behind him made him wheel around. He wasn't alone after all. Standing on a golden perch behind the door was a decrepit looking bird that resembled a half plucked turkey. Harry stared at it and the bird looked Balefully back, making its gagging noise again. Harry thought it looked very ill. Its eyes were dull, and even as Harry watched, a couple more feathers fell out of its tail. Harry was just thinking that all he needed was for Dumbledore's pet bird to die, while he was alone in the office with it. When the bird burst into flames, he yelled in shock and backed away into the desk. He looked feverish around in case there was a glass of water somewhere but couldn't see one. The bird, meanwhile, had become a fireball. It gave one loud shriek and next second there was nothing but a smoldering pile of ash on the floor. The office door opened. Dumbledore came in, looking very somber. Professor Harry gasped, Your bird, I couldn't do anything. He just caught fire. To Harry's astonishment, Dumbledore smiled. About time too, he said. He's been looking dreadful for days. I've been telling him to get a move on. Oh, şu an şu an önemli bir şey fark ettim lan. Ya bu Fox'un öldüğü tek yer burası diyecektim ama 5. kitapta da birkaç kere ölecek. <gülüyor> Dumbledore sağ olsun. Ama yine ilginç. Kendi eceliyle öldü tek yer burası falan gibi seri boyunca. He chuckled at the stunned look on Harry's face. Fox is a phoenix, Harry. 
Phoenixes burst into flame when it is time for them to die and are reborn from the ashes. Watch him. He looked down in time to see a tiny, wrinkled newborn bird poke its head out of the ashes. It was quite as ugly as the old one. It's a shame you had to see him on a burning day, said Dumbledore, seating himself behind his desk. He's really very handsome most of the time. Wonderful red and gold plumage. plumage. Fascinating creatures, phoenixes. They can carry immensely heavy loads. Their tears have healing powers, and they make highly faithful pets. In the shock of Falk's catching fire, he had forgotten what he was there for. But it all came back to him as Dumbledore settled himself in the high chair behind the desk and fixed Harry with his penetrating light blue stare. Before Dumbledore could speak another word, however, the door of the office flew open with an almighty bang and Hagrid burst in. A wild look in his eyes, his black lava perched on top of his shaggy black head and the dead rooster still swinging from his hand. It wasn't Harry Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid urgently. I was talking to him seconds before that kid was found. He never had time, so Dumbledore tried to say something, but Hagrid went ranting on, waving the rooster around in his agitation, sending feathers everywhere. It can't have been him. I swear I didn't eat in front of the Ministry of Magic if I have to. Hagrid, I... You... You... You... You... You got the wrong boy, sir. I know Harry never hugged said Dumbledore loudly. I do not think that Harry attacked those people. Oh, said Hagrid, the rooster falling limply at his side. Right, I wait outside then, headmaster. And he stomped out, looking embarrassed. You don't think it was me, Professor? Harry repeated, hopefully, as Dumbledore brushed rooster feathers off his desk. No, Harry, I don't, said Dumbledore, though his face was somber again, but I still want to talk to you. Harry waited nervously while Dumbledore considered him the tips of his long fingers together. I must ask you, Harry, whether there is anything you'd like to tell me, he said gently. Anything at all. Anything, my boy, anything. Harry didn't know what to say. He thought of Malfoy shooting, you'll be next, mud blows and of the polyjuice potions simmering away in Morning Myrtle's bathroom. Then he thought of the disembodied voice he had heard twice, and remembered what Ron had said. Hearing voices no one else can hear isn't a good sign, even in the wizarding world. He thought too about what everyone was saying about him, and his growing dread that he was somehow connected with Salazar Slytherin. No, said Harry, there isn't anything, Professor. The double attack on Justin and had nearly headless Nick turned what had he dared to be nervousness into real panic. Curiously, it was nearly headless Nick's fate that seemed to worry people most. What could possibly do that to a ghost? People asked each other. What terrible power could harm someone who was already dead? There was almost a pie to book seats on the Hogwarts Express so that students could go home for Christmas. At this rate, we'll be the only ones left, Ron told Hiri and Hermione. Us, Malfoy, Crab and Goyle. What a jolly holiday it's going to be. Crab and Goyle, who always did whatever Malfoy did, had signed up to stay over the holidays too. But Hiri was glad that most people were leaving. He was tired of people skirting around him in the corridors as though he were about to sprout fangs or spit poison. Tired of all the muttering, pointing, and hissing as he passed. Fred and George, however, found all this very funny. They went out of their way to march ahead of Harry down the corridor, shouting, Make way for the hair of Slytherin, seriously evil wizard coming through. Um, harika, harika. Fred and George, harika. Percy was deeply disapproving of this behavior. It is not a laughing matter, he said coldly. Oh, get out of the way, Percy, said Fred. Harry is in a hurry. Yeah, he is off to the Chamber of Secrets for a cup of tea with his fanged servant, fanged servant, said George shortly. Jean didn't find it amusing either. Oh, don't, she wailed every time Fred asked Harry loudly who he was planning to attack next, or when George pretended to ward, to ward him off with a large clove of garlic when they met. Harry didn't mind. It made him feel better that Fred and George at least 
<laughs> so the idea of his being Slytherin's heir was quite ludicrous. But the antiques seemed to be aggravating Draco Malfoy, who looked increasingly sour each time he saw them a little. It's because he's bursting to <laughs> say it's really him, said Ron, moving me. I have. You know who, you know how he hates anyone beating him at anything, and you're getting all the credit for his dirty work. Not for long, said Hermione in a satisfied tone. The polyjuice potions merely ready. We'll be getting the truth out of him any day now. At last, the term ended, and a silence deep as the snow on the grounds descended on the castle. He found it peaceful rather than gloomy, and enjoyed the fact that he, Hermione, and the Vizis had the run of Gryffindor Tower which meant they could play exploding snap loudly without bothering anyone and practice stealing in private. Fred, George, and Ginny had chosen to stay at school rather than visit Bill in Egypt with Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. Percy, who disapproved of what he termed their childish behavior, didn't spend much time in the Gryffindor common room. He had already told them pompously that he was only staying over Christmas because it was his duty as a prefect to support the teachers during this troubled time. Terrible time, the members are the troubled time, the mission is then interesting. Christmas morning dawned cold and white. Harry and Ron, the only ones left in their dormitory, were woken very early by Harmony, who burst in fully dressed and carrying presents for them both. Wake up, she said loudly, pulling back the curtains at the window. Harmony, we're not supposed to be in here, said Ron, shielding his eyes against the light. Merry Christmas to you too, said Harmony, throwing him his present. I've been up for nearly an hour, adding more lace wings to the potion. It's ready. He sat up suddenly wide awake. Are you sure? Positive, said Harmony, shirting scabbers the red so that she could sit down on the end of Ron's four poster. If we're going to do it, I say it should be tonight. At that moment, Hedwig swooped into the room, carrying a very small package in her beak. Hello, said Harry happily as she landed on his bed. Are you speaking to me again? She nibbled his ear in an affectionate sort of way, which was a far better present than the one that she had brought him, which turned out to be from the Thursdays. They had sent Harry a toothpick and a note telling him to find out whether he'd be able to stay at Hogwarts for the summer vacation. <laughs> the rest of Harry's Christmas presents were far more satisfactory. Hagrid had sent him a large tin of treacle toffee, which Harry, uh, which Harry decided to soften by the fire before eating. Ron had given him a book called Flying with the Cannons, a book of interesting facts about his favorite Quidditch team, and Harmony had bought him a luxury eagle feather quill. He opened the last present to find a new hand-knitted sweater from Mrs. Wizzy and a large plum cake. He read her card with a fresh surge of guilt, thinking about Mr. Wizzy's car, which hadn't been seen since its crash with the homping willow, and the bout of real breaking he and Ron were planning next. No one, not even someone dreading taking Polyjuice portion later, could fail to enjoy Christmas dinner at Hogwarts. The Great Hall looked magnificent. Not only were there a dozen frost-covered Christmas trees and thick streamers of holly and mistletoe crisscrossing the ceiling, but then chant snow was falling, warm and dry from the ceiling. Dumbledore let them in a few of his favorite carols, Hagrid booming more and more loudly with every gobbled of eggnog he consumed. Percy, who hadn't noticed that Fred had bewitched his prefect beige so that it now read Pinhead, kept asking them all what they were sniggering at. He didn't even care that Dr Draco Malfoy was making loud snide remarks about his new sweater from the Slytherin table. With a bit of luck, Malfoy would be getting his come you puns in a few hours' time. Come you puns, where are the Francis Japan kelime? İşte, I don't know anything about it. Böyle şey, intikam, hak ettiği şey gibi bir anlamı var. %99.9 Harry and Ron had barely finished their third helpings of Christmas pudding, pudding demedim, when Harmony ushered them out of the hall to finalize their plans for the evening. 
we still need a bit of the people you're changing into, said Haimari, matter of factly, as though she were sending them to the supermarket for laundry detergent. And obviously, it'll be best if you can get something of crabs and goros. They're Malfoy's best friends. He'll tell them anything. And we also need to make sure the real crab and goro can't, can't burst in on us while we're interrogating him. I've got it all worked out, she went on smoothly, ignoring Harry's and Ron's stupefied faces. She held up two plump chocolate cakes. I feel this with a simple sleeping draught. All you have to do is make sure Crab and Goyle find them. You know how greedy they are. They are bound to eat them. Once they are asleep, pull out a few of their hairs and hide them in a broom closet. Harry and Ron looked incredulously at each other. Hermione, I don't think that could go seriously wrong. But Hermione had a steely glint in her eye, not unlike the one Professor McGonagall sometimes said. The portion will be useless without crabs and gross hair, she says sternly. You do want to investigate Malfoy, don't you? Oh, all right, all right, said Harry. But what about you? Whose hair are you ripping out? I've already got mine, said Hermione brightly, pulling a tiny bottle out of her pocket and shoving them the single hair inside it. Remember Medicine Balstrode wrestling with me at the dueling club? She left this on my robes when she was trying to strangle me. And she's gone home for Christmas, so I'll just have to tell the Slytherins I decided to come back. When Hermione had bustled off to check on the Polyjuice potion again, Ron turned to Harry with a doom-laden expression. Have you ever heard of a plan where so many things could go wrong? Bana o kadar da şey gelmedi abi. Ron ve Harry biraz abartıyormuş gibi geldi. But to Harry's and Ron's utter amazement, stage one of the operation went just as smoothly as Hermione had said. They lurked in the deserted entrance hall after Christmas tea, waiting for Crab and Goyle, who had remained alone at the Slytherin table, shoveling down four helpings of trifle. Trifle, aynen. Harry had perched the chocolate cakes on the end of the banisters. When they spot Crab and Goyle coming out of the Great Hall, Harry and Ron hid quickly behind a suite of armor next to the front door. How thick can you get, Ron whispered ecstatically as Crab gleefully pointed out the cakes to Goyle and grabbed them. Grinning stupidly, they stuffed the cakes whole into their large mouths. For a moment, both of them cheered greedily, looks of triumph on their faces. And without the smallest change of expression, they both killed over backward onto the floor. By far the hardest part was hiding them in the closet across the hall. Once they were safely stowed among the buckets and mops, Harry yanked out of out a couple of the bristles that covered Goyle's, Goyle's forehead and Ron pulled out several of Crab's hairs. They also stole their shoes because their own were far too small for Crab and Goyle's size feet. Then, still stunned at what they had just done, they sprinted up to Morning Myrtle's bedroom. They could hardly see for the thick black smoke issuing from the stall in which Hermione was stealing the cauldron, pulling their robes up over their faces. Harry and Ron knocked softly on the door. Hermione, they heard the scrape of the lock, and Hermione emerged, shiny face and looking anxious. Behind her, they heard the gloop gloop of the bubbling, glutinous portion. Three glass tumble, tumblers stood ready on the toilet seat. Did you get them? Hermione asked breathlessly. Harry showed her Goyle's hair. Good. And I sneaked these spare robes out of the laundry, Hermione said, holding up a small sack. You'll need bigger sizes once you're Crab and Goyle. The three of them stared into the cauldron, closed up. The portion looked like thick, dark mob, mud, bubbling sluggishly. I'm sure I've done everything right, said Hermione, nervously reading the splosh page of most potent portions. It looks like the book says it should. Once we're drunk, it will have exactly an hour before we change back into ourselves. Now what? Ron whispered. We separated into the three glasses and ate the hairs. Hermione ladled, ladled large dollops of the portion into each of the glasses. Then her hand trembling, she took... She shook Millicent Balstrow's hair out of its bottle into the first glass. The potion hissed loudly like a boiling kettle and trotted madly. A second later, it had turned a sick sort of yellow. 
<clears throat> essence of medicine bolstrol said wrong i eat it with loathing but it tastes disgusting at your stance at harmony he dropped goes here into the middle glass and Rome put crabs into the last one. Both glasses hissed and froted. Goyos turned the key color of a burger crabs a dark murky brown. Hang on, said Harry as Ron and Hermione reached for their glasses. We'd better not all drink them in here. Once we turn into crab and go, we won't fit. And mirrors and both throws not pixie. Good thinking, said Ron, unlocking the door. We'll take separate stalls. Careful not to spill a drop of his polyjuice potion, he slipped into the middle stall. Ready, he called. Ready, came Ron's and Hermione's voices. One, two, three. Pinching his nose, he drank the potion down in two large gulps. It tasted like overcooked cabbage. Immediately, his insides started writhing as though he'd just swallowed the live snakes. Doubled up, he wondered whether he was going to be sick. Then a burning sensation spread rapidly from his stomach to the very ends of his fingers and toes. Next, bringing him gasping to all fours, came a horrible melting feeling, as the skin all over his body bubbled like hot wax, and before his eyes, his hands began to grow, the fingers thickened, the nails broadened, the knuckles were bulging like balls, his shoulders stretched painfully and a prickling on his forehead told him that hair was creeping down toward his eyebrows. His ropes ripped as his chest expanded like a barrel bursting its hoops. His feet were agony in jaws, four sizes too small. As suddenly as it had started, everything stopped. He lay face down on the stone cold floor, listening to Myrtle gurgling morosely in the end toilet. With difficulty, he kicked off his shoes and stood up. So this was what it felt like being Goya. He crept a little and he didn't know. His large hand trembling, he pulled off his old robes, which were hanging a foot above his ankles, pulled on the spare ones and laced up Goya's boat like shoes. He reached up to brush his hair out of his eyes and met only the short growth of wiry bristles low on his forehead. Then he realized that his glasses were clouding his eyes because Goyle obviously didn't need them. He took them off and called, Are you too okay? Goyle's low rasp of a voice issued from his mouth. Yeah, came the deep ground of crap from his right. He unlocked his door and stepped in front of the cracked mirror. Goyle stared back at him out of two deep set eyes. He stretched his ear, so did Goyle. Ron's door opened. They stared at each other, except that he looked pale and shocked. Ron was indistinguishable from crab, from the padding ball hair cut to the long gorilla arms. This is unbelievable, said Ron, approaching the mirror and prodding crab's flat nose. Unbelievable. We'd better get going, said Harry, loosening the wash that was cutting into Corey's thick wrist. We still got to find out. Where the Slytherin common room is, I only hope we can find someone to follow. Ron, who had been gazing at Harry, said, You don't know how bizarre it is to see Goyle thinking. He banged on Hermione's door. Come on, we need to go. A high-pitched voice answered them. I, I don't think I am going to come after all. You go on without me. Hermione, we know medicine boss grows ugly. No one's going to know it's you. No, really, I don't think I'll come. You two hurry up. You're wasting time. He looked at Ron, bewildered. That looks more like Goyle, said Ron. That's how he looks every time a teacher asks him a question. Hermione, are you okay? Said Harry through the door. Fine, I'm fine. Go on. He looked at his watch. Five of their precious 60 minutes had already passed. We'll meet you back here, all right? He said. Harry and Ron opened the door of the bathroom carefully, checked that the coast was clear and set off. Don't swing your arms like that, he muttered to Ron. Huh? Crap holds them sort of stiff. How's this? Yeah, that's better. They went down the marble staircase. All they needed now was a Slytherin that they could follow to the Slytherin common room, but there was nobody around. Any ideas, muttered Harry? Huh. This Slytherin has always come up to breakfast from over there, said Ron, nodding at the entrance to the dungeons. The birds had barely left his mouth when a girl with long curly hair emerged from the entrance. Excuse me, said Ron, hurrying up to her. 
You've forgotten the way to our common room. I beg your pardon, said the girl stiffly. Our common room? I'm a Ravenclaw. She walked away, looking suspiciously back at them. <laughs> Harry and Ron hurried down the stone steps into the darkness, their footsteps echoing particularly loudly as crabs and goyos' huge feet hit the floor, feeling that this wasn't going to be as easy as they had hoped. The labyrinthine passages were deserted. They walked deeper and deeper under the school, constantly checking their watches to see how much time they had left. After a quarter of an hour, just when they were getting desperate, they heard a sudden movement ahead. Ha, ah, said Ron excitedly. There is one of them now. The figure was emerging from a side room. As they hurried nearer, however, their hearts sank. It wasn't a Slytherin. It was Percy. What, what are you doing, doing down here? said Ron in surprise. Percy looked affronted. That, he said stiffly, is none of your business. It's crap, isn't it? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, said Ron. Well, get off to your dormitory, said Percy's turning. It's not safe to go wandering around our corridors these days. You are, Ron pointed out. I, said Percy, drawing himself up, am a prefect. Nothing is about to attack me. A voice suddenly called behind Harry and Ron. Draco Malfoy was strolling towards them, and for the first time in his life, Harry was pleased to see him. There you are, he drawled, looking at them. Have you two been pigging out in the great hall all this time? I've been looking for you. I want to show you something real, real something really funny. Malfoy glanced withering at Percy. And what are you doing, doing down here, Wizzy? He sneered. Percy looked outraged. You want to show a bit more respect to a school prefect, he said. I don't like your attitude. Malfoy sneered and made motion for Harry and Ron to follow him. Harry almost said something apologetic to Percy but caught himself just in time. He and Ron hurried after Malfoy, who said as they turned into the next passage that Peter Weasley. Percy and Ron corrected him automatically. Whatever, said Malfoy. I've noticed him sneaking around a lot lately, and I bet I know what he is up to. He thinks he is going to catch Slytherin's hair single-handed. He gave a short derisive laugh. Harry and Ron exchanged excited looks. Malfoy paused by a stretch of bare, damp stone wall. What's the new password again, he said to Harry. I uh, said Harry, oh, yeah, Pueblot, said Malfoy, not listening, and a stone door concealed in the wall slid open. Malfoy marched through it, and Harry and Ron followed him. The Slytherin common room was a long, low underground room with rough stone walls, a ceiling from which round greenish lamps were hanging on chains. A fire was crackling under an elaborately carved mental piece ahead of them, and several slitherings were silhouetted around it in high-backed chairs. Wait here, said Malfoy to Harry and Ron, motioning them to a pair of empty chairs set back from the fire. I'll go and get it. My father's just sent it to me. Wondering what Malfoy was going to show them, Harry and Ron sat down, doing their best to look at home. Malfoy came back a minute later, holding what looked like a newspaper clipping. He thrust it under Ron's nose. It'll give you a laugh, he said. Harry saw Ron's eyes widen in shock. He read the clipping quickly, gave a very forced laugh, and handed it to Harry. It had been clipped out of the Daily Prophet, and it said, Inquire at the Ministry of Magic. Arthur was the head of the misuse. Ana, Arthur was the bölümün başıymış kendi kısmının. Head of the misuse of Muggle artifacts office was today fined 50 galleons for bewitching a Muggle car. Mr. Lucius Malfoy, a governor of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, a governor. Jesus, Malfoy'un babası da yönetici gibi bir şeymiş lan şeyde. Büyük ihtimal senatosu falan var bu Hogwarts'ın. İkisini de bilmiyordum ha. Where the enchanted car crashed earlier this year called today for Mr. Weasley's resignation. Bir dakika. Governor of Hogwarts School of Fish Crown and Wizardry. Mr. Weasley de öyleymiş. Weasley has brought the ministry into dispute, disrepute, Mr. Malfoy told our reporter. He is clearly unfit to draw up our laws and his ridiculous muggle protection act should be scrapped immediately. Mr. Weasley was unavailable for comment, although his wife told reporters to clear off or she'd set the family goal on them. 
Well said, Malfoy impatient is, and he handed the clipping back to him. Don't you think it's funny? Haha, <laughs> said Harry bleakly. After Weasley loves Muggles so much, he should snap his wand in half and go and join them, said Malfoy scornfully. You never know the Weasleys were pure blows the way they behave. Rons or other crabs, face was contorted with furry. What's up with you, crabs? snapped Malfoy. Stomach ache, Ron grunted. Well, go up to the hospital wing and give all those mud blows a kick from me, said Malfoy, snickering. You know, I'm surprised the Daily Prophet hasn't reported all these attacks yet, he went on thoughtfully. I suppose Dumbledore's trying to hush it all up. He'll be sacked if it doesn't stop soon. Father's always said old Dumbledore is the worst thing that's ever happened to this place. He loves muggle borns. A descent headmaster would never have never, never, let slime like that creepy in. Malfoy started taking pictures with an imaginary camera and did a cruel but accurate impression of Colin. Potter, can I have your picture, Potter? Can I have your autograph? Can I take your shoes, please, Potter? Burada, burada bence çok güzel bir ayrıntı olmuş. Hani Malfoy Colin takvini yapacak. Colin puzzle Harry diyordu Harry'e. Hani bu Potter diye. Çünkü Malfoy cidden Potter diye. Malfoy cidden insanlara soyadlarıyla hitap ediyor falan. Hani böyle asil bir aile olduğu için soyadı onun için öncelik falan. Hani ya da öyle de yetiştirip üstüne falan. Hani böyle Potter diye takvini yapması çok iyi olmuş. Yani. He dropped his hands and looked at Harry and Ron. What's the matter with you two? But too late, Harry and Ron forced themselves to laugh, but Malfoy seemed satisfied. Perhaps Crabbe and Goyle were always slow on the uptake. Saint Potter, the mud blossom's friend, said Malfoy slowly. He's another one with no proper wizard feeling, or he wouldn't go around with the jumped up Granger mud blood. And people think he's Slytherin's here. Harry and Ron waited with bated breath. Malfoy was surely seconds away from telling them it was him, but then. I wish I knew who it is, said Malfoy petulantly. I could have, I could help them. Ron's jaw dropped so that Crab looked even more clueless than usual. Fortunately, Malfoy didn't notice, and Harry, thinking fast, said, "Thinking fast, said, you must have some idea who is behind it all. You know I haven't, Goyle. How many times do I have to tell you, snapped Malfoy, and Father won't tell me anything about the last time the chamber was opened either. Of course, it was 50 years ago, so it was before his time, but he knows all about it. And he says that it was all kept quiet and it does look suspicious if I know too much about it. But I know one thing. Last time the Chamber of Secrets was opened, a mudblood died. So I bet it's a matter of time before one of them's killed this time. I hope it's Granger, he said with relish. Roma's clenching crabs gigantic pistols. Feeling that it would be a bit of a giveaway if Ron punched Malfoy, Harry shot him a warning look and said, Do you know if the person who opened the chamber last time was caught? Oh yeah, whoever it was, was expelled, said Malfoy. They're probably still in Azkaban. Azkaban, said Harry puzzled. Azkaban, the wizard prison, Goyle, said Malfoy, looking at him in disbelief. Honestly, if you were any slower, you'd be going backwards. He shifted restlessly in his chair and said, Father says to keep my head down and let this hair of Slytherin get on with it. He says the school needs reading of all the mudblood filth, but not to get mixed up in it. Of course, he's got a lot on his plate at the moment. You know, the Ministry of Magic raided our manor last week. He tried to force Goyle's dual face into a look of concern. Yeah, said Malfoy. Luckily, they didn't find much. Father's got some very valuable dark art stuff, but luckily we've got uh, we've got our own secret chamber under the drawing room floor. Oh, said Ron. <laughs> said Ron. Malfoy looked at him, so did Harry. Ron blushed. Even his hair was turning red. His nose was also slowly lengthening. Dear Howard was up. Ron was turning back into himself, and from the look of horror he was suddenly giving Harry, he must be too. They both jumped to their feet. Medicine for my stomach wrong granted them without further ado. They sprinted the length of the Slytherin common room, hurled themselves at the stone wall, and dashed up the passage, hoping against hope that Malfoy hadn't noticed anything. He could feel his feet slipping around in Goris' huge shoes and had to hoist up his ropes as he shrank. 
they crashed up the steps into the dark entrance hall, which was full of a muffled pounding coming from the closet where they had locked Crab and Goyot. Leaving their shoes outside the closet door, they sprinted in their socks up the marble staircase toward Morning Myrtle's bathroom. But it wasn't a complete waste of time, Ron panted, closing the bathroom door behind them. I know we still haven't found out who is doing the attacks, but I am going to ride to dead tomorrow and tell him to check under the Malfoy's drawing room. Harry checked his face in the cracked mirror. He was back to normal. He put his glasses on as Ron hammered on the door of Hermione's stall. Hermione, come out. We've got lots to tell you. Go away, Hermione squeaked. Harry and Ron looked at each other. What's the matter, said Ron. We must be back to normal by now. We're... But morning Myrtle glided suddenly through the stall door. Harry had never seen her looking so happy. Oh, wait till you see, she said. It's awful. They heard the lock slide back and Hermione emerged. Sobbing, he robs pulled up over her head. What's up, said Ron uncertainly. Have you still got Millicent's nose or something? Hermione let her robs fall and run back into the sink. Her face was covered in black fur. Her eyes had turned yellow and there were long, pointed ears poking through, the, through her hair. It was a cat hair she hauled. My Millicent balls rolled. We must have a cat, and the potion isn't supposed to be used for animal transformations. Ah, oh, said Ron. Bunu böyle okunacağını bilmiyordum. Bir an okuyunca doğru okudum ve öğrendim nasıl okunduğunu. Mutluyum. We'll be tea something dreadful, said Myrtle happily. It's okay, Hermione said very quickly. We'll take you up to the hospital wing. Madame Pomfrey never asks too many questions. It took a long time to persuade Hermione to leave the bathroom. Morning Myrtle sped them on their way with a hearty go fall. Wait till everyone finds out you've got a tail. Jesus, öyle bir şey var mıymış? Chapter 13. Okay, görüşürüz.